Episode 2, Mike Davis. Welcome to Gut Plus Science. Analytics about people. Insights for executives. Truth you can act on. A high-energy, fast-paced, results-oriented exchange featuring employee engagement evangelist and CEO, your host, Nikki Llewellyn. Welcome back to Gut Plus Science, the best podcast for America's greatest leaders. On this show, we talk people, people in the workplace and how we as leaders can help employees make the greatest and most meaningful impact. I'm your host, Nikki Llewellyn. I have the honor of working alongside some of the best CEOs and presidents in our nation and collaborating with them to share their learnings so that all of us can grow and thrive. My inspiration this week comes from an interesting statistic. 70% of leaders put people and culture in their top three company initiatives. However, only 20% of those leaders can report an ROI on the things that they're doing to move the needle on engagement and culture. That's crazy. So if people and culture are such a high priority, then why do you think that most leaders that are putting, you know, time and energy into engagement and culture are having a hard time seeing a measurable positive outcome. Are you still using Pulse surveys? How about annual questionnaires? If your organization relies on either of these, it's time to discover Amplify. Amplify has created a new way to measure employee engagement. It's where CEOs who want to know what's really happening within a workforce go to get honest feedback and to understand what needs to change for people to love their work. Companies that have used Amplify have increased productivity by as much as 30% in just three months. Best of all, it's not just data that Amplify provides. Executives get hands-on coaching with engagement specialists, people who know exactly what to do with the data. To see their latest research on employee engagement, visit Amplify.com. Our guest today, Mike Davis, is going to help us explore this idea and dive in a little bit further. One thing that he shared with me is a life saying, a principle that he lives by, uh, which I really love. It's, I want my success in life to be people and not projects. This is something he lives by, lives it out. It's in his office and um, something that he shares with his leadership team regularly. And I'm thinking it's a pretty predictable experience that he puts out in his culture at Harley Davidson, um, which gets that uh, more expected employee experience that he can really count on because he's then the smaller percentage of leaders who can report an ROI on the things that they're doing. And so let's learn more about Mike's philosophy before I turn it over to him. Let me tell you just a little bit about him. Before becoming an entrepreneur, Mike started out in customer service as a rep for U.S. Airways. He climbed the ranks to become the VP of customer service for Delta Airlines overseeing 5,000 employees. Mike is now the owner-operator of many Harley-Davidson dealerships in Ohio with over 200 employees. I'm excited to talk to Mike today about his personal mission and focus on leadership and development. Mike, thank you for joining me today. Tell me, how did you come up with your saying, your, your foundational quote, I want my success in life to be people and not projects? Tell us about that. I came up with that myself, but it from years ago and that I was smart enough to recognize that, you know, projects happen. But people live on, and you, you invest in people, and you know, people accomplish projects, but people also grow other people, and it's a much more valuable return on your investment. Amen to that. Yeah, that's great. We're going to dive in. We want to learn from you today, especially with me talking about that stat on so many leaders, and that is our vast majority of who listens to this podcast, our presidents, CEOs, key executives, and they're like, gosh, people, we want we want to um, really move the needle on our people. We want them to stay here. We want them to pour into the work that they're doing here, but it's just a lot harder than it sounds. So I, I would love to hear from you. I always like to kick off with, I have a strong belief that failure is one of our greatest catalysts to become great, to become better. And so I would love to hear from you. What has been your greatest failure turned lesson with regards to people and culture? And that could be in your background in the airline industry or at Harley Davidson. Just what's been that big teaching? Here's what comes to mind is I think my biggest failure as a leader has been trying to change someone who doesn't align with our core values. You know, at times we can get enamored with someone's talent and then we 
because of that talent, we want to make excuses for how they behave because we like the short-term results we're getting. And we always think we can fix people, but the reality is we're not qualified or in the business to fix people. We're there to lead them. And if we don't align, if they don't align with our values early on, they're not going to align with them later on. And the damage that can be caused to your culture and your overall business by allowing uh, people to continue to stay because you believe you can fix them when they're not going to align with your values, it just sets you up for failure. If I can't spend three hours in a car with someone, thoroughly enjoy it and feel like we are feeding each other, like just really um, developing and, and it's, a, it's a great ride, you know, for three hours, then that's my indicator that I'm not hiring that person. Question, when it comes to your culture at Harley Davidson, now I want to speak into like where you're at now um, and your employees, what makes your culture unique? We're in a business that you know, values cool and edgy and, you know, that independent free spirit. And we try to embrace that. But at the same time, we're more of a, we value fun and nice. We focus on how we treat people. You know, I was once asked by someone at Harley Corporate, you know, what our secret sauce is. And I said, you know, we hire nice people and we encourage them to be nice. And in reality, I think that pays for it. We focus on that people that connect because that makes a difference with the staff and it makes a difference with the customers we engage. How do you make that come alive in the different locations and helping your managers embrace that? Well, here's what I tell our folks, and I still to this day do all the uh, new hire orientation talks uh, when I'm in town. I, I tell people fun is one of our values. And, and by fun, I mean this, I, I believe you can be fun and still be highly professional. I believe you can be fun and not come at someone else's expense. And I think you can be fun and be highly productive. But understand, it's not my job to make someone be fun. Fun comes from you. You have to be fun to work with. You have to be fun to engage. And I tell our folks, look in the mirror before you leave home and make sure you be fun to do business with today. And if not, adjust at home because we don't want to adjust you here and have you mess up the rest of our folks having fun and a good time. You know, you just said something that I think is so important. I often say you can't, as a leader, like a CEO or a president, you can't delegate your culture. Yes, you can delegate initiatives and get, you know, your managers and executive team on the same page. Absolutely. But you can't just say, you know what, that's not my job as a CEO or president. I've seen that go incredibly poorly. What I love that you just said is I do our new employee orientation. I just think that makes such an impact. The reality is if I don't care for our culture, no one else will. And I, I don't think it's ever to be delegated. I think that's the primary responsibility of the CEO. I totally agree. hundred percent on the same page. So, Hey Mike, what is your favorite book or what is a book you're reading right now that you would recommend out to our listeners? I'm a big John Maxwell and a Pat Lencioni fan. I've done the five dysfunctions of a team study with my team more than once. And I think, I think it's uh really core training. Uh, and I love the four obsessions of CEO because it talks a lot about, uh, by Patrick Lencioni, because it talks a lot about you have to, as the owner, own that culture and how people are coming into your company and who gets to come into your company. Great authors. And they've got such a lineup of awesome books out there. John Maxwell, Patrick Lencioni. The thing you just said that I'd like for you to elaborate a little bit on is you said training. You've brought in five dysfunctions. I've heard you talk before on, you know, retreat days that you're doing. So how do you do that? Like you've got employees spread out in four different locations. Um, you have many different managers. Like what does training look like in your organization? We do a lot of what we call soft skills training. I mean, we have technical skills, obligations, and safety training obligations, but over and above that, we have an annual training plan just for employee development. One of the things we do is uh, once a year, we close all four stores and bus all of our folks into Ashland University for a day of development uh, where we kick off our year. And then monthly, we require every leader monthly to come into a central location. We have a central training room in one of our stores where um, actually I'll be flying up to make sure I hold that training tomorrow where they have four hours of development training a month year round that goes on and every quarter, once a quarter, eight hours. And it's just the continual investment. It's all soft skills about how we treat people, how we connect with people, how we lead our people. And it's, it's a continual investment. Do you bring in outside speakers sometimes that are not just internal uh, employees or leaders or who, who's the lineup of who trains? 
Absolutely, we do. We do a couple of things. You know, at, at our offsite, you know, we hired a gentleman that's nationally recognized in the motorcycle industry, and Sam Dantzler, to come in and do uh, sessions with us. I have a good network of leaders that um, I meet with on a regular basis, and we kind of help each other out. Where I'll have, I'll go talk to their employee group and do some training, and they'll come talk to mine. I just did a session two weeks ago for one of the gentlemen that'll do that'll do training for us, and there's about uh, six or seven of us in that network that'll do that for each other. I mean, we kind of each have our uh, strong points, what we train well on, so we we play off of each other. Talk about that for a second. I'm really big into like iron sharpens iron. And especially as a CEO or a president, you have to consistently be around peers that are not necessarily in your business that are just sharpening you. You're sharpening them. Like what I know some things from you, uh, offline conversations, but can you talk about what you do to consistently make sure that's happening for yourself? I continually find time. I have a lot of breakfast meetings where I, if I, there's a successful leader in our region or our area that I can get a hold of and get quality time with and talk to them about what's going on in their organization. I have a leader that I meet with every Thursday and have for over 10 years that we share experiences with. And then I have a small group of leaders. There's 10 of us that meet once a quarter and we exchange best practices and we do a rotation where one of us you know, comes up with the topic that we're going to talk about. As a matter of fact, last quarter I did it on uh, a topic titled, Do You Really Understand What It's Like to Work For You? We meet quarterly like that and challenge each other and share resources with each other. It's the same guys that we do some training for each other. Okay, so when it comes to recruiting or developing leaders that work directly with you for you, what are the most important attributes that you look for? When I'm looking for a leader, I mean, obviously we want some level of experience, but we have that hire for attitude, train for skill mindset. So we're looking for connectivity. I'm looking for people who are able to adjust their level of engagement to different teams. You know, I think too many people want to lead people from where you want them to be. And I believe you need to lead them from where they are today. You know, one size doesn't fit all. Yeah, I have some really successful leaders in our company that I have to adjust my communication based on the leader I'm talking to so I connect to them and get the most success with them. And uh, I think it's the responsibility of the leaders to manage and lead their teams like that, that they need to adjust the team when it comes to connection. And so I'm looking for people who are connect, you know, have connectivity, people want to connect with. Top leadership quality, connectivity. I love that because it just like spurs off onto so many like branches, like influence, authenticity, eye contact, you know, not being on your phone while talking to your people, you know, those kinds of things. I just, I love that. Okay. Who's your greatest inspiration? I would have to say my wife. And the reason I say my wife is I don't know anyone who knows how to treat people better than she does. And many times I will default to, you know, what would Francine do? Because she understands how to treat people and people are excited to engage with her. Now, my children also inspire me, and I, and I think that's always because I've set really high expectations for them, and that motivates me to make sure I'm delivering for them. And so, you know, I'm really inspired by our, the members of my family, but particularly my wife and my children. I was just reading an article over the weekend about marriage and family and all of that, and I know you know this, but what you just said is a rarity. So that is a, that's a huge gift. That's awesome. Next question for you is, so the show is called Gut Plus Science for a reason. The reason is because as leaders, if we strictly make decisions in our business based on our gut, that can cause us some challenges, but we have to have our gut. We have to have our past experiences partnered with data to truly make the best decisions. So that's why the show is called what it is. So my question for you is how do you leverage data versus your gut in the HR realm or the culture realm of your business? This is something I believe we're getting better at, uh, at doing, you know, in, in fairness, HR data regarding things like turnover, they tell you, you have a problem. It just won't tell you what that problem is. And I think that's part of the data challenge. You know, we, we track our turnover rate by location, by department. We actually track it by manager. And we know that some of our, obviously, our best performing managers have really, coincidentally, seem to have really low turnover. Uh, and I don't think it's a coincidence. I think 
because the data is not going to always tell you where the problem is, I think that's where my instincts and my gut comes in. And that, that's where my past experiences have to come into place. So I'm making good assessments of where we need to move or what we need to do with our uh, HR related issues. I think what I just really took away from what you said is the ability to slice and dice data because it's one thing to look at turnover numbers. It's another thing to look at drill drilling down and looking under each manager. Oh, absolutely. Right. That's so important. So how do you measure your organization's success across the board? I mean, we're not just talking culture. We're talking everything. Like, what do you do? What are some of the key tools or, or processes you use? We have operational metrics that we that we measure to make sure we're succeeding. Obviously, one measure is ensuring we operate a fiscally sound business. If we don't, we put people at risk and uh, we can't do the good things that we do to give back. So we need to have a good uh, fiscally sound business. You know, however, if we're making money and we're not making a difference in people, then I would tell you we're not succeeding. We, we focus, you know, our, our company's theme is that we want to make a difference in people's lives. And we measure, for instance, at the end of every month, our general managers obviously have operational statistics they have to report, but they actually have, they do a, a little brief report card that is all about employee engagement. Did I take an employee to lunch this month? Did I have my employee roundtable this month? What manager did I spend mentoring time with? Things like that. And we do that so that they know it's top of mind. So you've done a lot with starting at Harley, buying your first store in Dover and where you've gone in that adventure. Obviously, you can't operate like you are today to get where you want to go next. That or you've got to multiply <laughs> multiple times probably to, to continue going where you want to go. What What is the, the future of the culture of your organization? One of the challenges we have as we've grown, we are in multiple locations. So I, I can't touch every wall and I can't touch every employee every day. And so I have to be identifying initiatives that I can develop, I would say, uh, good disciples, people that are, are duplicating those same efforts so that in my absence, the culture is being instilled just as strong as if I were there. And so we're spending intentional time on culture. Additionally, you know, I, I talked to you about the time we're investing in our leadership development training. You know, we've always done uh, leadership development training, but it's been seasonal or sporadic. And now we have a consistent process we're working on a, an internal document right now where we're going to have Ohio Motorcycle Group 101, 201, and 301, which is basically that says, in your first year with us, these are the things that we would have exposed you to and invested in you and training you regarding leadership and our culture. And in the second year, you would have gotten this. And in the third year, you would have gotten this so that we know we have a deliberate way that we move people on through that. We're asking, I, I have a thing written on my grease board that says, if we are who we say we are, then why don't we? And then I have dot, dot, dot. And so I'm constantly asking the question is, you know, if we're who we say we are, then are we doing the things that that should represent? And, and I think that if we don't continue to think like that, complacency is the first step to failure. And, and I'm not going to let our organization fail because we get complacent about our culture and our people. You know, the demographics change. I have my demographics change because I have employees getting older and more seasoned in our company. You know, we've got 15 year employees at this point. I still have new hires and I've got to continue to make sure that uh, we embrace both ends of that. And I think Amplify helped us identify some of that, that maybe we weren't spending enough time with the old guys. And uh, they felt a little bit like, hey, you're just expecting us to continue to be great. And we are. It comes with responsibility, but that doesn't mean they need to not be ignored. So I think uh, it's just a continual evolution. The two things I just took away from what you said, deliberate development of people, that is a true differentiator in organizations. So it's just amazing how many people don't have that path. But, you know, going back to the stat of 70% of leaders put people and culture as the top, but then only 20% can measure. You can measure watching people raise through the ranks or watching their performance increase or whatever. And it's the basis of all of that is the development that we inspire them to, we, you know, we, we could give them all the training we want, but if they don't do anything with it, that's one thing. So it's like this mix between giving them the platform and the inspiration to, to get there. So that's cool. And then the other is complacency is the first step to failure. Gosh, that's so important. You know, there's so many people in the world right now, you know, the economy is great and we're all 
for the most part, doing pretty well. And it's easy to start coasting because things are good, you know, and then when things change, because it won't stay beautiful like this always. And it's, that's the thing is like, did we get complacent in that growth initiative and, you know, in the, in the high time. So, so good. Mike, can you think of anything before I summarize some, some topics that we talked about today that you would just want to put out there, challenge thoughts, anything for our listeners? No, I tell our folks, hey, every day you're going to make a difference. It's just what kind of difference you're going to make. And if you focus on people and being constructive and positive with people, you'll have a much better day. In our conversations with CEOs and hiring managers, we hear they're frustrated with traditional recruiting. From outrageous fees to focusing on candidates before clients, the process was broken and needed to be fixed. Enter Titus Talent. Titus Talent Strategy serves its clients using passionate people, a proven process, and unparalleled performance. Oh, and did we mention they guarantee the performance of their candidates for 12 months? If you want to learn how they're disrupting the recruitment space, head over to TitusTalent.com. That's T-I-T-U-S-T-A-L-E-N-T dot com. All right, guys. So Mike Davis sure is an inspiring guy, isn't he? I would encourage you to continue the conversation with him by connecting with him on LinkedIn. You can find him under Michael Davis on LinkedIn. So now I'm going to get to the truth you can act on section of Gut Plus Science, which is really the opportunity for me to summarize some key takeaways that you can take back to your teams or share with a friend that you know is in need of this information for their organization. All right, couple things. One, hire for cultural fit. So important. Up front, make sure that this human being is not just being hired for skill set, but for cultural fit, meaning that they're going to jive with the rest of your organization and help everyone be better. Uh, you don't want to go back and fix that later. Um, and one of the greatest tests is just thinking through uh, how long would you like to hang out with this person outside of work? Um, that's a really good test because they you should want to you know hang out and be friends with them. So that's one. Number two, the power of soft skills training. For those of you that are really good at soft skills stuff, it's not everybody. Some people really struggle with it. And it's just so important as leaders not to take the things that we or other leaders on our teams have as just natural skills. We need to develop our people from the communication that is uh, pretty basic from relationship skills, building friendships, knowing, you know, etiquette, you know, of how to show up. And, and there's just so many things. So I just encourage you to think through not so much the mechanical things and the high level skills that they need as employees to do a great job, but the soft skills training as well and take retreats, you know, get them away, do some team building and um, really just help develop your people. And number three, build disciples. So Mike is exceptional at this. Um, you know, it's it's like the Tony Dungy. If you're familiar, I'm sure you are if you've ever seen football in your life. Uh, one of the greatest NFL coaches, Tony Dungy. I mean, those players would walk through fire for him. They won Super Bowl with him. And so when you build disciples, you are really building a custom culture to your organization, being authentic, allowing your people to get to know you and your leadership, being visible, and just, you know, empowering leaders to have personalized relationships with their people and make make people first. So those are my three tips for you today, guys. I'm really excited to wrap up this show today and be on to our next one. And we'll look forward to having Mike back in the future. So Gut Plus Science, see you next time. We just left the world a little bit better. Now go do something with it.